Good morning. This is for the Shabbat service of June 26, 2021. And we've now come to the end of our series here at Narkey Street Congregation in Jerusalem, where we've been looking at Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline. And this Shabbat morning, we are looking at his last spiritual practice he calls celebration. And as we come to the conclusion of these spiritual disciplines, some might ask, why have I invested so much time and energy into such a boring topic as spiritual discipline? When you think of discipline, you often might think of your parents or your teachers. And you could say there's nothing really sexy or exciting about discipline, such a dull and stuffy subject. But we call ourselves disciples of Jesus, and a disciple is a student, someone who receives instruction from a teacher. And discipline is inherent to our name. A disciple must have discipline. And so if we are not seeking the Lord's discipline, how can we call ourselves disciples of Jesus? And Let's just start with the verse from Proverbs 4.13. It says, hold on to discipline, for it is your life. Like learning to fly an airplane or drive a car, proper instructions, good teaching, a practiced discipline might one day save you when you are facing a life and death situation. And so too, these spiritual disciplines that we've been looking at, meditation, prayer, fasting, study, simplicity, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, guidance, and now celebration. All of these are practices that lead us to life. They are a path to the Lord in our daily lives, which are consumed with our mundane tasks like work, shopping, cleaning, government bureaucracy, doctor visits, or even vacation. As Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So put simply, God's word is always directing us to life. It is a path that is narrow and few follow it. The sexy highway, on the other hand, is wide, but it leads to death. And so these disciplines, these spiritual practices that we've been looking at, help us stay on the right path, especially when times get tough and we want to quit. For example, this past year with COVID-19 has been a tough year. Things have gotten better here in Israel recently, but there's still a lot of negative things ahead um, with this new variant, Delta, that's coming out. And a lot of people around the world are still suffering from the effects of this coronavirus. Nearly 4 million people have died. And many of us personally know those who have suffered and even some who have died. And so during this year of COVID, we've lost loved ones, but not just from COVID, we've lost them for all the normal reasons of people suffering from sickness. For example, like our former pastor here at Narquis Street, Chuck Cop. So the final discipline this morning, celebration, could seem a bit pompous or at best perplexing in such a time of suffering as this. How can we celebrate in the midst of so much suffering and death? And this, this is the great paradox of the spiritual discipline of celebration. We are not ultimately celebrating how we feel or what we've accomplished or what we have gained in this life. But rather, as disciples of Jesus, we are celebrating the giver of that life. And hardship may define a path that we're walking on, but death is not the end. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Jesus himself modeled this paradox. He suffered and he died on the cross, but after three days, he rose again to new life. And as that great Easter sermon goes, 
today may be Friday, but Sunday is coming. And so here in the modern nation of Israel, every year we mourn the war dead on Memorial Day. It happens every late spring and it starts at sundown and shortly after the sun goes down, there's a one minute siren that's heard across the country where Israelis stand up in silence, even stopping their cars to stand outside during the one minute of silence. All places of entertainment are closed and somber music and programs are broadcast. The following day, when the sun comes up, there's a two minute siren that sounded across the country where once again, people stop what they're doing, they stand up and they take two minutes of silence. Memorial candles are lit and the names of the fallen in war are read in ceremonies throughout the country, in schools and public places. It's a true time of grieving. But as that 24 hours of Israel's Memorial Day is coming to a close at that following sunset, Israel is also preparing for a party. Because when the sun sets at the end of Memorial Day, the country explodes into celebration, celebrating Israel's independence, which was declared in 1948. And so you have this great juxtaposition in Israel, remembering the death that preceded its life. Within that final hour of sunset, the death of the people transposes to the resurrection of the nation. The path and the death that so many families in this land have endured, whether they're Jewish or Arab, is not to be taken for granted or swept under a nationalistic rug. Life is precious, no matter who you consider the enemy, no matter who wins what war, no matter how we want to interpret history. All life is precious, according to scripture. So in this shadow of Israel's death and resurrection, all of us who live here today in the land of Israel must ask ourselves, will we use ourselves, will we use our lives selfishly for ourselves? for our family, for our tribe, for our cause? Or will we live selflessly? Will we seek to save those who are going down the highway of destruction? And will we, if we discover we're veering off onto that popular and crowded highway that everyone else is going on, and it's so easy day to day for us kind of venture off on the easy highway, will we check ourselves? Will we try to recalibrate our selfish desires and return to that narrow path that Jesus calls us to? And as a foreigner here, I daily struggle with this, wanting to ignore all of the human complexities woven into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As a foreigner, I have no reason to get my hands dirty. But our former pastor, Chuck Kopp, was born on Israel's Independence Day. And according to legend, even the hour. And he died recently, a couple of weeks after Independence Day this year. And Chuck was someone who got his hands dirty because he was always looking to help, especially when it came to finding common ground between Arabs and Jews and particularly among Palestinian Christians and Messianic Jews. Chuck suffered for 17 years with Parkinson's and in particular in the last years of his life, it was especially hard when he struggled with the most basic needs which he could not do himself. His long suffering was hard, especially for his wife Liz and their family. Um, but at his funeral, which was at the beginning of May, um, the cemetery there on Emek Rafaim was, it was filled with a large crowd, hundreds, and it was watched by hundreds more on the internet. And there was a spirit of peace there. Sadness, yes, but despair, no. There was hope. There was joy. And even when we were lowering Chuck's body into the grave and the handles 
that were on the coffin snapped off and everyone gasped as his coffin fell crashing down head first into that hole. In retrospect, I think it was a final lesson from Chuck to us all of him saying, lighten up, relax. I am no longer in this body. Death is not the end. It was his final laugh. And as we were burying Chuck, different people took shovels and hoes and they filled in his grave as is common here in Israel. And I made sure that uh, my three sons also got to shovel in some dirt because I wanted them to get their hands dirty so they would one day recall their part in sending Chuck off. And I also wanted them to remember whose footsteps we follow in in the faith, whose shoulders we stand on, and how community, this great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us, how community connects and feeds our individual lives in the Lord. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. As followers of Jesus, we've been called to walk in Jesus' steps, to get our hands dirty, and to produce good fruit. As he said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So as we're looking at the spiritual discipline of celebration this morning, we're not speaking about fulfilling our desires or finding some vague happiness or getting high on life. As Foster puts it, the joy of the Lord is not merely a good feeling. It is acquainted with suffering and sorrow, heartache and pain. It is not found by seeking it. It does not come by trying to pump up the right emotions or by having a cheery disposition or by attempting to be an optimist. Joy slips in unawares as our attention is focused upon the kingdom of God. So in other words, practicing celebration or joy is not produced by our willpower. It's a grace that grows from the seeds of suffering that we find planted in the soil of our human existence. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's James 1 verses 2 to 4. So how do we respond to our hardship and what fruit do we produce from that hardship? Joy is a fruit. It's a fruit of perseverance when we keep walking with the Lord and not giving up. And as we encounter challenges in our walk, our ability and our desire to obey the Lord and his word is honed every time we make simple choices that are right. As Foster says again, in the spiritual life, only one thing will produce genuine joy. Obedience. Joy comes through obedience to Christ. Without obedience, joy is hollow and artificial. To elicit genuine celebration, obedience must work itself into the ordinary fabric of our daily lives. God's normal means of bringing his joy is by redeeming and sanctifying the ordinary junctures of human life. So overcoming daily obstacles by obeying God's word also gives us a new perspective on the simple things of life. Good food, clean water, or a beautiful day. And we will not grasp the meaning of being thankful, of being grateful, until we have struggled and messed up. Finding contentment in the Lord grows from that pain. So both thankfulness and contentment are attitudes of joy. As Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And then down to verse 12, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, 
whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Just as Nehemiah said to the people, as they read his word out loud in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. So we can celebrate eating and drinking when our strength is found in the joy of the Lord. We feed our faith when we are content and thankful for how he's provided for our needs. And likewise, that joy can inspire us when our times are more difficult and hope seems lost because that joy is not found in ourselves. Um, it's not found just in myself, it's found in all of us. It's deposited in community among people. And our community is like an external hard drive that you plug into your computer. Uh, it backs up the most important data. And so for the church, for the community, that external drive is what holds on to our collective memory of God's faithfulness. And whenever we fall into hard times, we can plug in to that external hard drive into that community and be reminded what God has done in history among others and among ourselves. And it's because we always forget that's what humans are, but we need each other to remind ourselves of God's goodness and his faithfulness. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 3, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? So Paul here, he's this pillar of the church, and he's writing to the church in Thessalonica, and he's saying, it's your faith there that's encouraging me to go on during my hard times. And that is just a powerful reminder and a powerful witness of what community is for the body of Christ. So joy is a corporate discipline. It requires one another you cannot celebrate by yourself. Who's ever heard of a party for just one person? When the woman who found her coin that she lost in the parable of Jesus in Luke 15, when she found it, what'd she do? Luke 15, 9 says, she called her friends and neighbors together and she said, let's party, rejoice. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So just like you need others to lean on when times are hard, you also need others to celebrate when times are good. So our body, our community is vital for experiencing real joy in our walk with the Lord. And finally, our joy correlates to how much trust we put in the Lord. Our joy is connected to our trust in the Lord. Do we believe that God exists? Do we believe that he is holy? Do we think that he is good? Do we remember on a daily basis that he loves us? And do we live as if he is in complete control of this world and what's going on, especially when times are bad. So Hebrews 12, starting in verse 5, says, Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says in Proverbs 3, 
My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their fathers? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate. You're not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers, and they disciplined us, and we respected them for it. But how much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? Our earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces the fruit of peaceful righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Now, the writer of Hebrews here is drawing a metaphor that many of us can understand. Our loving father disciplines his child. The discipline is not the goal, but it's the means to the goal. And so, too, it's a good reminder that these spiritual disciplines are not the point this morning. They're only tools. They're only instructions. They're only teaching to help us get to where we are going. And that's to walk closer with the Lord. And likewise, a parent wants their child to mature and become like him, a healthy functioning adult. Equally, God the Father wants us to grow up and become like him, holy. But just because someone grows up and becomes an adult and they put away their childish behavior, it doesn't mean that we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. You'll recall that Jesus said in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must be like children by humbling ourselves. And Jesus, again, modeled this principle when it says in Philippians 2, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave. By looking like other men and by sharing in our human nature, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, in Israel this last week, it's been the end of the school year, so there's been plenty of school parties and celebrations and we have three boys and they've been having their end of the year parties at their schools and our youngest son Semach just graduated out of kindergarten which we call Gan here and so he's our final child who will graduate from Gan from kindergarten and Sharon's pointed out Sharon my wife has pointed out to me over the years as we've been participating in these Gan events that Israelis have this very peculiar culture when it comes to celebrating their five and six year old children in Ghan. For example, anytime there's a ceremony or a party like Hanukkah end of the year where the parents come and they wanna see their children perform or graduate, the parents usually come in the evening to the event and they're usually wearing whatever they had it, they were wearing at work that day and so there might be some high heels and dresses or a police uniform or any of the other uniforms that you see around in society. And so everybody's dressed in their official adult clothes. And then we all go into the classroom and we all sit on these little itty bitty kid chairs. And they're about the size of this on the bottom. And it's really funny to watch all of our adult bodies trying to squeeze onto these tiny chairs. And Sharon has said if something like this were to happen in America, the parents would be in an uproar. But here in Israel, no one complains. No one even notices because all the eyes are focused on their kids. And everyone's got their camera, their smartphone out, and they're recording the moment. And everyone's proud to see their little star. And it's funny, and it's fun, and it's just accepted here in the Israeli culture when it comes to celebrating children 
a bunch of adult parents unconsciously lowering themselves to the level of their children. Foster says, celebration helps us laugh at ourselves. We come to see that the causes we champion are not nearly so monumental as we would like to believe. In celebration, the high and the mighty regain their balance and the weak and the lowly receive a new stature. Freed of our inflated view of our own importance, we are also freed of a judgmental spirit. Others do not look so awful, so unspiritual. So let's celebrate as a community that God is our father and that he loves us and that his eyes are on us because he's proud of us. And even when we sin, when we stumble and fall, we are still his children. No one deserves his grace more and no one deserves it less. Let us eat and drink and celebrate now for today is the day of salvation because he is in control of tomorrow. Pain is not forever. We all eventually graduate from this life and death is not the end. So hang in there, don't give up. The Lord has called us to carry one another in our times of need and suffering, but also to be there when we need to celebrate. And may our former pastor Chuck Copp's last lesson linger with us. It's okay to get your hands dirty. Lighten up and laugh. The joy of the Lord is our strength.